Welcome to Strata Originals. Today, I'm really excited. We're talking to Mark Lubner. I've been excited to do this podcast for a while now. Uh, Mark is the Group Chief Executive Officer at Africa Tiken, and it is an, a South African nonprofit. And I'll let Mark tell us about it, but first, welcome, Mark. Thank you very much. I'm very excited to be part of today's podcast. In fact, I'm honored. What, why don't we start by talking a little bit about a normal day for you? The, the irony is that um, there is no normal day, uh, quite frankly, in, in my life. And that's actually a blessing um, because we're working with um, children and youth who are dynamic and you have to look at them and see them as dynamic. You know, systems that were designed years ago are no longer necessarily relevant uh, today. Uh, TikTok, for argument's sake, today versus uh, you know, Facebook 10 years ago. So my day typically um, is a very inspired one because um, uh, I wake up with my head full of ideas and thoughts about how do we help young children and youth graduate over time into jobs in which they're going to be productive, which they're going to love. Now, if they love their jobs, if they have enough confidence in themselves, if they believe in themselves, if they shake off the victim mentality that often exists for kids living in impoverished environments, then given an opportunity, they're going to excel. And that's exactly what our country desperately needs. Um, it's not a well-known fact, but uh, the South African population comprises predominantly young people. If you look at the age curve in the country, uh, from 15 to 18 years old is our biggest age population. And those individuals have all been raised on cell phones. They, they might be you know, getting poor educations from the government, but the truth of the matter is they're getting worldly um, exposure and they kind of have a sense that they want to do something with their lives. They don't simply want to be on social grants. And therein lies the challenge. So Africa Tikkun is all about how do we create opportunities? How do we develop individuals from early, early infancy, teach them values, fundamentally teach them to believe in themselves, and then introduce them to skills and competencies that are aligned to their interests and introduce them then into the working environment. And that's pretty much what we're doing at Africa Tikkun um, with approximately 30,000 odd kids at any one particular point of time um, going through that program and process. Can you give us a sense of the environment for these sure. for these children? Uh, yeah, uh, complex uh, because we are in truth a young democracy. Um, the apartheid veil was collapsed, thankfully, uh, only 30 years or so ago. And the reality is that we are now in that post-apartheid phase where, in fact, many of the youngsters that we work with you know, didn't really experience apartheid, but they have grown up in an environment where during apartheid, township environments, shanty towns were created, separate from where the places of work were. Close, but still a distance to travel. And so you've got these millions of young people growing up in impoverished environments, infrastructure lacking, social infrastructure lacking, if they had parents around while they were growing up, their parents were invariably working far away. So their parents didn't necessarily you know, give them the time, the parental guidance that necessarily an organization like ours now necessarily needs to bring in. So you, you're finding kids who are either uninspired, even though they've grown up, as I say, with cell phones, they were conscious of the world, they want jobs, but they don't really know about what are they good at? What can they aspire to? Where are their horizons and, and what are the limits or challenges that they need to overcome? So um, the, the background is that the South African government has spent an enormous amount of money post-apartheid helping to uh, you know, build houses, um, create some level of infrastructure. Um, but we went from you know, a situation where we were looking after 4 million whites to now having to look after a population of over 50 million. And you know, the tax budgets haven't necessarily grown sufficient to cater for that. So there, there's a lot of um, underprivileged living conditions across the country. 
with that comes unemployment, comes crime, an economy that hasn't been growing over the last number of years. So you're seeing quite a number of retrenchments, particularly with COVID and post-COVID. And that directly impacts um, these children and youth who are struggling to not just only develop career paths, but to struggle to survive. Um, forgive me if I just digress for a second, but can you imagine that the South African government, when COVID hit, gave companies, civil society organizations, essentially 10 days notice to say, in 10 days time, everybody's gonna be locked into their homes. And we literally are going to police that. Now we've got for argument's sake, as I say, 30 odd thousand children and youth that come to us daily for meals. How are we gonna feed them? Mm. How, and you can't feed a child in a home alone. The child comes from a family. So you've got to start taking care of the entire family. So we found ourselves for argument's sake, faced with the situation, we had to feed 500,000 families and had 10 days in which to prepare for that. So those are some of the crises typically that we would have to necessarily deal with. There is, however, um, a indefatigable spirit amongst South Africans of all races, of all classes, quite frankly. We do come together when there's a crisis, remarkably so. Um, we don't do a great job planning in advance, but when uh, the, the problems are there, typically then South Africans somehow seem to be able to you know, pull rabbits out of the hat, um, as we experienced, you know, in the uh, in the lockdown um, pertaining to the uh, uh, pandemic. So, so Mark, I have, to ask, I have to ask this: sure. How did you make out? How did, how did we? Well, what we did is uh, we we uh, coordinated with uh, approximately forty odd other civil society organizations, community-based organizations. We uh, went on a massive fundraising appeal, an initiative that was created between the private sector and the public sector uh, called the Solidarity Fund was formed and four and a half odd billion was raised in, in a matter of a couple of months that was allocated towards um, you know, protective equipment, food supplies, food security, um, uh, and vaccine rollouts. Um, and we just jumped on that bag and we said, put our hands up and said, we're in the township communities. The township communities trust us because we've been around for 28 years. Um, we'll use our centers as emergency relief centers. And from those centers, we then, in, we took teachers for argument's sake that would normally be involved in uh, our, our child and youth development programs. And we turned them into AIDS workers and sent them out into the field to distribute food. We set up vaccine stations at our centers and uh, together with the Department of Health, we started providing vaccinations. You know, it was, um, it, it was really an interesting time because it bonded a number of us together against a common uh, threat. And I'm pleased to say a number of those bonds still exist today. Hence, what Africa Tikkun has been doing since the pandemic is taking what we call our cradle to career model, uh, early childhood development, after schools youth development, career guidance and development, and then job placements. And we're now taking that through these other community-based organizations across the country. And what we're finding is that government is now saying, this is cool, this is impact to scale. How do we now get behind this rather than necessarily uh, perpetuating just a high degree of fragmentation, which has been a problem, I think, in our industry, uh, in, in, in the social impact philanthropic uh, you know, industry. We, we still, again, part of the legacy of apartheid is we have over 250,000 non-for-profits registered, but all pulling in different directions. What the pandemic did is it pulled us all together. And we're now capitalizing on that and taking our model um, to a much bigger audience. I love the statement and I want to highlight it, cradle to career, because that's so important and it shines such a positive light on what you're doing. So literally taking youth and and making sure they have what they need till a time when they learn to be self-sufficient and can be employed. You see, then it almost comes out of a rather hard uh, look at philanthropy, if I may be blunt. Um, I came out of the commercial world, uh, 
uh, I was with a family business that grew globally, and then I ran um, a public company. And um, um, I'll chat to you a little bit about how I got into this particular field in a second. But for 17, 18 years now, I've been involved in this field of social impact work. And I found that what we were doing is, so we were feeding. We, we were running feeding schemes all over the place. So what? Tomorrow we're going to have to feed again. We, we weren't breaking that cycle. Yeah. We got involved in early childhood development as our first foray into child and youth development. So what? So we ran great early childhood development programs. Kids would end up, age of six, now ready to go to school, and they would face a really lousy schooling system. So we had to necessarily say, well, we've got to provide an after-schools program. And we said, well, great. So we've now invested in early childhood development, after-schools development. But these are still kids who are living uh, you know, an hour two from their you know, places of, of employment. And they haven't got the money to afford the transport um, to get to, to even the interview. And if they arrive at an interview, they're probably number 50 in line. They don't know how to even differentiate themselves in an interview process. So we had to then extend ourselves into this job skills training and helping kids to understand where the job markets necessarily the future lay. For IR, coding, um, data processing, um, drone technologies, et cetera, et cetera. So we, we, by, by being able to introduce um, where the world of work is going into the training environment and back ending it into the subject choices that these kids were looking at when they're in their school going years. You can now see how that whole cycle hangs together from cradle, early stage development of values, all the way through to skills development and job placements. <clears throat> and the intent is really to ensure that we are putting more productive people into the working environment because productive people create more employment. Yeah. Yeah. And, and they're really probably very loyal also. Yeah, you know, we have an alumni that now uh, last count was about 11,000. And the alumni came up with a program of their own that they would take a week, a year off, unpaid leave, many of them from their jobs, <clears throat> just to give back. So they come and they help out in a variety of ways during that week. It could be helping kids on the sports field. It could be helping with, you know, uh, uh, final year school students with their prep exam preparation. Uh, and although it doesn't sound like much, um, for many of these individuals to forego a week's pay is meaningful. But more importantly, that they should choose to pay it back shows, I believe, a, uh, an appreciation for that which they've had, when that's been given to them. It's not just take, take, take. The mindset is to give back in return. That's amazing. Yeah. I, I'd love to, I want, bef before I ask you the next, next question, I'm going to just do a little bit of a icebreaker break. Um, sure. Because I want people to get to know all different sides of you, not just what you do during the day. I, I want them to kind of get to know your personality because I think to get to know somebody is to get to love somebody. So, right. um, so I'm going to ask you this icebreaker question. It's my favorite one because it's light. Um, if you could live in any sitcom, what sitcom would you live in? Uh, well, I guess I can't be Captain America but I think I could probably fit into a Schitt's Creek quite well. Yeah, good one. <laughs> it's, you know, what, what I loved about that program, that sitcom, is it just grew on you. Yeah. You know, and as you got more and more engaged in it, it just kind of grew on you. And, and I think the takeaway for me was that there's room in the world for a whole variety of different people. And you know, everybody has the ability at any particular point of time to make choices in their life that affect their outcomes. It's not going to be done for you. You, ha you have to take responsibility for the outcomes that you want. And no matter how zany, crazy, weird, wonderful uh, you might be, I'm not going to use the word abnormal <laughs> because I don't want to create the impression that the characters are abnormal, but they were certainly out of the norm. But they created a world for themselves uh, and, and they bonded together as a family. Uh, despite all of their issues, and as a I family, think they also like to say quirky. 
quirky. That's what I'm looking for. Quirky. And I love that. You know, I love the fact that this world is um, crazy enough, big enough, loving enough to to allow any any anybody and everybody to create their own world. Yeah, yeah, and and that we could be accepted, have acceptance of all different True. kinds, right? Correct. You know, that, that's so awesome. I've never actually had anybody say shit's freak, so that's perfect. <laughs> and beautifully explained why. So that's. that's um, so the next thing I wanted to ask you about was Operation Smile. Smile Foundation. Yeah. Well, Smile Foundation. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. 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 Now, the, I, don't, I don't know why I think of it as Operation Smile, but because yeah. there's a great organization in the United States called Operation Smile that, in fact, we partner with, um, oh. and have been partnering with for a number of years, and um, we met through. Um, I, I, I've been very fortunate to be a member of the Young Presidents Organization, and through the Young Presidents Organization, I met the founder of, of Smile, and we've nice. been partnering together here in Africa. Nice. So Smile nice. Foundation, uh, very briefly, um, had a very interesting start. Um, I received a call one day uh, from the then State President, Nelson Mandela, um, to try and assist him it was in the days when he was asking businessmen and women across the country to assist with the rebuild of the country. And so it was about 25 years ago. I asked if I would help to get one particular young child who had a facial abnormality um, uh, to, to, to get the surgery performed uh, that could correct that facial abnormality. The reality was that the um, skill base did not exist in the country. And uh, through the YP organization, I was able to find um, a, a surgeon in Canada, and I was able to find a team of doctors from Johns Hopkins who were willing to come to South Africa. I got Mandela to write a letter of invitation to them. And they came here out here to operate on this young girl, Tanda Malamba Manyati, who, by the way, today is the face that you will see at Africa Tikkun. She sits at the front desk reception, um, and despite the fact that her face is still not completely uh, normal, if I can call it that. And, 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 and the condition is uh, that the child faced was a facial paralysis condition, Mebius syndrome, and it requires very uh, extensive surgery where you take a piece of, and I'm being used using layman terms, take a piece of the muscle from inside the, the leg, the gracilis muscle, and you plant it into the facial orbit and you reconnect veins and, and, and blood vessels. And then the child is called the smile child because the child has to learn to grimace because they cannot speak and they cannot chew with the condition that they've got. So that was how smile came about. I, I literally had the unbelievable experience of um, going to Mandela's home and sitting with this great man talking about how we were going to launch and build this organization. So uh, I funded it, uh, the launch of it, and um, uh, it grew over time to the point where today we would be instrumental in performing over a thousand surgeries a year. We've partnered specifically with state hospitals rather than the private sector uh, because we feel that's where the skill base is most needed. And we operate on kids that have got um, they come from very disadvantaged backgrounds with various forms of facial, hand, feet, uh, deformities. But we provide a psychosocial support structure as well for the families, as well as an enormous amount of training. Um, uh, our public sector, um, unfortunately, health sector, uh, does not have the budgets that they should have. And so organizations like us play an important role in training surgeons, nurses, uh, and the likes. So uh, it's, it's a fabulous organization. And it dovetails, by the way, with Tikkun, although they're two separate entities, and I'm probably the common link. The, the, what happens is because Tikkun is working in township environments, impoverished environments, we're able to identify children and families who would otherwise hide their kids away uh, for fear of being socially ostracized because of you know, a, a community that doesn't have a solution to a problem like that typically tends to ostracize the family. So we're able to identify those, bring those kids forward to SMILE. SMILE is then able to secure the surgical intervention, the psychological support, and then um, the, the children are integrated back into society again. 
So um, again, it's all about these co collaborative structures that are so important. And you really get involved. Oh yeah. And um, I in fact miss the uh, days when I used to actually go into theater, I used to go into surgery and uh, uh, I probably shouldn't admit this publicly, but assisted uh, the surgeons with some of the operating procedures. And my biggest charge used to get, um, even today, I mean, Tikkun has now grown to be the largest charity in South Africa in terms of gross revenues. Um, my charge that I get is when I meet with the families who have entrusted their kids to our care, whether that's in the hospitals, uh, where they get a woman who steps off a bus from a rural area and hands her child literally from her breast to us uh, to, to have that child operate from the cleft palate or burn, to a family who necessarily brings their kids to us uh, in our community centers and says, please help create a career pathway for this child of mine. Um, that's where I get my real charge. That gives me my, you know, uh, uh, my, my, my real buzz in life, quite honestly. You know, I've had the years of making money. I was very fortunate. The family did very well internationally, globally. Um, part of the family uh, built an international group called the Balron Group that operates safe loans and operates safe light uh, automotive glass replacement in the United States, which you probably know. So I, I have my own private equity, um, as I say, business. Uh, I'm still involved in family um, portfolio management. The real charge that I get is this human to human interconnected connection because that's sustainable. That's what I'll take with me when I finally close my eyes. And by the way, I, I share this again somewhat personally. Uh, I unfortunately went through a divorce. I was uh, and still am probably a bit of a workaholic. And it was very difficult for uh, my wife to raise kids with a, a workaholic who, whilst might have been physically present, wasn't necessarily emotionally as present as I should have been in retrospect looking back as I divorced 15 years ago. But I realized that the greatest gift I was able to give my kids was not a inheritance, a cash inheritance. Uh, they can blow that. They can, have, they can be irreverent about money. Rather teach them what the value of money is for people who don't have it. Then they will appreciate whatever it is that they've got. So whether they've got the latest iPhone or whether they've got, you know, uh, a, a, an old model, as long as it works and they can communicate, they'll have a respect and an appreciation for that. And that's the same value principle, responsible kindness is what I, I, I try to imbue throughout our organization. Then you've been successful. If people can learn to survive, sustain themselves, doing things that they love, they're not going to need you necessarily. And then you can devote your energies and efforts to the next cadre who, who do need the inspiration and they do need the hand up, as it were. Yeah, responsible kindness. That was the um, the other word, the other two words that stuck out um, when we spoke last was responsible kindness. It's um, You have so many unbelievable phrases that are very visual. Um, you have a story um, around meeting uh, the mother of a child who was coming to the hospital from a rural area. And I wondered if you would tell that. Um, yeah, I mean, I still, uh, you know, get choked up about it. One of the things Smile does is we will um, pay for the transport costs to bring a, a, a parent and a child to the nearest hospital where we're operating. And there was one particular day where a woman had had to catch, I don't know how many buses and trains to get to from rural north of the, of the country. <clears throat> I think she probably spent two days traveling. And she arrived at the hospital. She had a little plastic bag, uh, one of those sort of bags that they give you when you go to the supermarket and you're buying quite a big purchase. So not even a suitcase. She had one child strapped to her back and she had the other child strapped to her front. And the child strapped to her front uh, had a cleft palate. Not a complex cleft palate, you know, for, for, for those who are in the know, you, you get multiple types of, uh, of clefts. So, so this wasn't a, a bilateral cleft, it was just simply cleft lip um, and, and, and um, cleft palate. So the child couldn't suckle properly. 
and as the child is suckling, obviously, from her, the, the mother's breast, so the milk was sort of flowing all down the child's face all over the place. And this poor woman, you know, was obviously concerned because the child wasn't getting sufficient nutrition. And um, she had traveled all this way. Um, she was barefoot. Um, the only, as I say, belongings that she had with her was in this plastic bag. And she handed over her child to me and after I had done my talk to all, all the parents to tell them what the, the protocol was and what procedures were going to be. And she said to me, I only have one question to ask. And she was talking through an interpreter because she didn't speak English. And the nurse was translating for me. She says, the mother wants to know where's the morgue. And I said, what would she want to know where the morgue is for? We're going to be operating on a child's cleft. It's not life-threatening. Sure, there's always risk. She says, no, in her mind, she thinks that her, the chances of a child's survival are very slim. Uh, and she just would like to know where should she go to collect the body. So here she was handing over her child, who was alive, very much alive, to us, entrusting that child to us. But she was taking the precaution of wanting to know where the morgue was so she was going to fetch the body later. If that, that kind of um, uh, it's empowerment. So Thank you. That trust, you know, uh, that you get from another human being, um, that's not something you can buy. And I'm pleased to say that child survived the operation well. Um, I think last time I looked, it was, must have been 10 years or so ago, um, that child was, you know, happily in school uh, and, and capable of functioning well in school. Yeah, the, the trust of people and, and the trust of people of authority as well, and knowing it's for the good of their child and yet still thinking that they probably, she would probably have to pick them up in the morgue is like, it's so heartbreaking. But And can you imagine, and this is, so this was, as I say, this was probably about 15 years ago. You know, the switchover from apartheid wasn't that recent. So this was a black woman coming from an impoverished environment handing over her baby to a white man in a public hospital uh, that previously wouldn't have served that sector of the community. You know, if, if you really just think about the psychology of that or um, you can really understand the depth of trust. Um, and, and therefore, we, we, we have to be responsible. We can't be flippant. Uh, it's not just about making certain we spend donors' monies properly. Um, you know, I make certain that I put my own money into the organizations that I run as well um, so that I can, you know, hand over hearts so I'm looking after other people's money as well as I'm looking after my own, if not better. But it's, it's more than just donor reports. It's really about the impact that we're having. That, that, that's what really matters. Yeah. And I, I would imagine that would be the first time she probably came into any kind of metropolitan area. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Into a hospital of any kind. You can imagine you know, she was used to field hospitals, and here she comes to this huge monolithic gray building, uh, which is multi stories high. It's one of the biggest hospitals, in fact, in the Southern Hemisphere. Yeah. I, I can't even imagine what was going through her head when she was seeing, when she was on the bus, when she was just about to get off the bus and, and wondering what, you know, what was going to happen next. Yeah. Just, um, Not, yeah, she, she, and, and, and no thought to who's going to feed her, who's going to accommodate her, uh, none of that at all, because all we had done is contacted her, we'd spoken to the field hospital, we'd reviewed some photos that had been sent to us from the field hospital, and we sent her the transport money, a little bit of money for food. When she arrived, obviously, we then took care of uh, all, all her um, you know, other physiological needs. So yeah, that was, uh, you know, those are good reminders, you know, that just bring you back to earth as to why you do what you do. And good reminders, I think, too, um, of how important the human connection is, the giving of our time and not just money. You, you know, um, I'll share a quick story with you. I have a, a young man still at school in the United States um, from um, Washington. And he decided 
on his own initiative. And I don't even know how he came to us, quite honestly. But I think he was surfing the net and you know, looking for something meaningful to do. And so he himself is a triathlon, triathlete. And he decided that he read a story about kids who in one of the townships typically drown, uh, a number of kids drown every year when the river floods its bank. It's a shanty town um, where people, you know, impoverished build shacks and invariably uh, in the winter months when things are dry, they build the shacks too low down on the riverbanks and then come uh, the rains and in particular global warming, we've had experienced some really extensive rains over the last few years, there's flooding and children lose their lives because they cannot swim. So he started an initiative where he raised money and got in touch with one of the aquatic organizations here in South Africa and on his own accord approached us to say, hey, I'm coming out in January. I want to start a swim training program. I want to teach kids in this particular township how to swim. Could you guys orchestrate it for us? And he's raised the money. He's put the parties together. He's found one of the local schools. So all, he did all the research on his own um, and spoke to them about us using their swimming pool. And he and his dad came out here, Sasha, um, and, and they came out here and pulled this whole program together, which you know, we're now taking over and will run. But he's an American kid, yeah. you know, concerned about these kids in townships of South Africa. I find that extraordinary. Yeah. I really did find that extraordinary. There's so many extraordinary people out there and what they want to do and, and they want to do something meaningful and to give back. And, you know, the fact that, you know, he went out and raised money and, and this was a cause that he felt really passionate about. I mean, you know, we have to hold those people up as good examples and, and right. You know, the, so often what happens is, you know, particularly when it comes to the field of work that I'm in, using donor monies, reporting appropriately on monies, that's appropriate. You've got it. I mean, that's a given. It's a normative. You have to be able to report on the effective utilization of money. And people equally don't want to see um, their money being spent on uh, unnecessary expenses. Sure. But my sense is um, we don't spend enough time really measuring impact as much as we still measure input yeah. you know xyz organization africa to the largest charitable organization measured by the industry watchdog by what parameter gross revenues generated yeah and in my view that doesn't say we're the best organization in the country uh, we'll be the best organization in the country where we can say donor money has translated into X number of kids that have been successfully placed in jobs. And 10 years later, they're still employed and have in fact climbed the corporate ladder or they've been entrepreneurial and started their own businesses and stuff like that. That's how we need to be measuring in you know, ourselves. Well, and also measuring, um, well, it's a hand up instead of a handout really. And mm -hmm. so they, but they take that back to their families and it lifts the family also. So. It's, yeah. It would be interesting over the years to see how many families and communities have been affected by, um, by you know, people working and, and having careers and, and I mean, I, because I think it sets examples in different communities. So, I mean, that would be an awesome metric to have. I don't know if we, we're starting to, 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 to track. I'm, you know, I'm somewhat naive that I should have done this ages ago. You know, the organization has been around 28 years. I've been here 18 years. Um, so what we have, you know, we do track uh, impact stats against certain benchmarks, school leaving ability, you know, uh, when they finish school, what are their school grades like, sporting involvement, community give back, um, job placements. But we haven't tracked what's happened post them finding jobs. Uh, we kind of thought that, well, that's, you know, our job ends there um, and, and can't be all things to all people, unfortunately. But I do think what we should have been doing is tracking where have those alumni necessarily all ended up and 
how many of them are giving back to their society in some form or another. Not necessarily to us, um, but you know, be it through church groups, community groups, civil organizations, and stuff like that. Have we inculcated an, a, a, a culture of giving back, uh, not just necessarily taking? Yeah, yeah. You know, South Africa is in a in a very difficult situation at the moment. Um, it's no secret that the uh, previous president and his cabinet ran this country effectively into the ground. Uh, Wide-scale fraud and corruption. But the basic South Africans are, I believe, you know, good people. You know, the corrupt few have unfortunately tainted the situation for the many. Um, and my belief is the, that when one starts to appeal to coordinated efforts by good people who want to see this country succeed, we very quickly can turn the situation around. And when I look at the youngsters that we work with, I have huge hope. Yeah. I have huge optimism. When I read the newspapers or when I look at, for argument's sake, financial investments um, on, made, made on my behalf, on behalf of my family, you know, there I'm a lot more cautious and maybe not as optimistic and stuff like this because I'm economically a realist. But at the same time, when I then come to work and work with the kids that I'm working with and I hear you know, what they do to advance themselves, gosh, I have such, such hope for this country. Yeah, yeah. Kids are amazing. They're our yeah. future, right? I know this sounds very cliche, but they are truly our future. And, you know, working with kids of whether they're um, ill or whether they're, you know, developing, whether they're, you know, just being kids, they're just so curious and inspirational it's it, it just gives everybody hope so you know we live in such a connected world interconnected world um with the internet today uh with social media um that um you don't have to necessarily subscribe to uh a, a, a life of victimhood or you know impoverished poverty for the rest of your life there are ways that you can, in fact, learn. Um, you can be entrepreneurial. Uh, you can, in fact, create uh, in a way that the world has never really provided opportunities previously. So no matter where you are, um, I, I honestly do believe that given the right motivation, um, you can, in fact, succeed. And along with your success comes others. Are there many areas that don't have the ability to, to connect? Um, I would reckon in some of the more rural environments, uh, there are, uh, where, where, where there is no uh, connectivity. Um, yeah, they're, they're, those kids are at a serious disadvantage. Um, and there are still a number of areas across South Africa uh, where the internet reach is not uh, present. So that is a problem. Um, yeah. and that being said, the cell phone penetration is particularly high um, in terms of per capita. So they would have access to this mobile? Yeah, I mean, there, there are initiatives where for arguments like um, solar is providing you know, sufficient power to generate um, you know, rechargeable phones, you know, rechargeable oh, phones. Um, and uh, again, so long as there is uh, Wi-Fi connectivity, um, which in Vibra, you can find, might have to travel a little bit to get it, but yeah. uh, generally the country is pretty well serviced with uh, yeah. interconnectivity. Yeah, I'm amazed because, you know, if, you, if anyone has ever scrolled through TikTok, you can see videos from far reaching areas, rural areas that you're, you're thinking, my God, like they have connectivity out there. Like they're standing in the middle of a field in an area that is, you know, it looks, it, it looks so remote, but yet they have connectivity, which is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Because they want to no, learn yeah. about those places, right? Yeah. And it's, it's, so it just shows that, uh, you know, you can in fact, um, 
you know, the, the older days of a, you know, a butterfly flaps its wings uh, in China and the reverberations are felt across Africa. Um, there really is merit in statements like that. Yeah, that's true. And before I ask you our closing, our closing icebreaker, I am so taken with that. Is it a painting behind you? Yes, uh, in fact, he's a, a Nigerian, uh, Solomon Obongu. Uh, I'm not pronouncing it correctly, Oboya. Um, and what I love, particularly his paintings around kids, he sort of captures the innocence of kids. Um, I'll get out of the way so you can see it better. <laughs> and for people who are listening to this on audio, it's a, a very striking painting of um, a South African child. Yeah. He's living in South Africa. He's actually Nigerian, inspiring artist. So far, I can say one of the things we do in our programs at Tikkun is we'll identify kids that have got a creative talent that are not going to fit comfortably into you know, administrative roles. And we will help them develop career pathways. We'll help them learn the skills that they need to be able to either be sound technicians, gaffers, uh, how to orchestrate their own songs, um, for argument's sake, which you can do to the, the, these oh, days with, yeah. with tech. So, and, and, and we'll help kids like that who maybe don't fit comfortably into life, i.e. the Schitt's Creek type kids. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we'll help them. I would have been yeah. one of those kids, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Black sheep. That's me. Well, um, I am, but I just, I would have, a, I have a perfect spot for that painting right there. So that would be great. That would be great. Okay. This has been the best and I could go on for another hour. We'll wrap up with our last um, icebreaker question, which is, have you had, or what is the most inspirational aha moment um, that still affects the way you structure your day today, or has has had a major impact on your future? Uh, you know, I've been very blessed. I've had a number of aha moments. You can appreciate, you know, w w walking the journey that I've walked. Um, <clears throat> from the woman I told you about with the child, all the way through to time spent with Mandela. But I would probably say, and it's going to sound, you know, maybe a little bit trite, but um, spending the last few years with my father, and, and, and why I say that is, you know, my father received like a knighthood here in South Africa for the work that he had done for the country. He was a very successful businessman, I've mentioned to you, you know, the businesses that, the business that he, and his brother built it, grew globally uh, into one of the world's largest glass automotive businesses. But I, I actually joined him in Africa to couldn't, not by uh, a, a, a original design. Um, I think I mentioned to you, I was running a public company. We privatized that, sold it off. And my dad had a bypass and it didn't go particularly well. And um, although they had to redo the, 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 the surgery, we were advised that he would only have about five or six more years left. And I spent those five, six years, in fact, it turned out to be 10, watching a man transform his priorities wow. uh, to what really mattered in life. Yeah. Uh, time with people. He f suddenly found that he made time, whether it was the caddy on the golf course or whether it was the guy comes up begging on the side of the road for food or whether it was the president of the country. He would make time and he would treat people um, as if they all mattered. And that to me has probably been my greatest aha experience looking back. People do matter. All people matter, you know. Um, there is good in every single human being. Um, I do believe that. Um, we don't necessarily always show it, and that's choice. Um, people have the ability to choose to not... Uh, 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 be cruel to the world, uh, but yet they still choose to be. Um, you know, you're seeing a perfect example in Putin at the moment, uh, irrespective of loss of life, is just you know, continuing. Yeah. So, so I do believe that the aha moment was that you have choice. Human beings have choice to be kind, to be responsibly kind. 
Um, and uh, I would guess that probably answers the question is what was my aha moment for those years that I spent with my late dad. Yeah, it's it's really about also having been present in the moment also. So yeah. because when you're so busy and your schedule is so busy, there's so many opportunities to connect with people and give them, you know, a few moments of your time or recognize that there's someone begging or that needs food or needs a couple of dollars and and really to be present in the moment for those people. And that's, you know, that's kind of what I took away from what you just said, but, you know, you're, you built a world around giving people time and building moments and helping them in the long term. So what an amazing, amazing legacy that is. Well, what, what a gift to be able to live my life that way. Oh, yeah, it, it is a gift. And, and it just shows how humble you are to say that. Mark, thank you. This was so amazing. Thank you so much. I'm very I, uh, I was so looking forward to this.